there are infinite opinions about what's happening in the housing market. Most of them are way wrong. They're based on headlines that are old and trends that maybe were happening a year ago. They're based on all kinds of stuff. And so actually having the data is part of the most powerful communication that we as real estate professionals can do to buyers and sellers. And so what Altos does is packages it up so that you can communicate to home buyers and sellers right now about what's happening. Hey guys, welcome back to the Triangle Real Estate Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Fagioli, here with the one, the only, Mike Simonson, founder of Altos Research, and now part of the much illustrious Housing Wire organization. How you doing, Mike? Doing great. Good to be here, Matt. Nice to see you. Yeah. And, you know, I have to call you by your, your real title, which is Data Geek, the original Data Geek. I think somewhere I still have my Data Geek t-shirt. We probably need a 2024 version. But man, it's great to to catch up with you. And I know that our listeners are going to be excited to hear what you have to say. You've always been, you know, one of the key voices in the market in terms of getting any kind of understanding of where we are and where we're going and where, where we've been with said data. But yeah, before we dive in, though, can you just, you know, tell everybody a little bit about you and Altos and all that? Yeah. So, you know, I'm the founder of Altos and, and at Altos, we track the housing market. We track every home for sale in the country every week. We track all the pricing, all the supply and demand, all the changes in that data. And then we bubble up the analytics so that people can know what's happening in the market uh, immediately as it happens. And so what we do with Altos is we package up the data so that realtors and brokers and loan officers and people in the industry can communicate to their customers, to their buyers and sellers, there are infinite opinions about what's happening in the housing market. Uh, most of them are way wrong. They're based on headlines that are old and trends that you know maybe were happening a year ago. They're based on all kinds of stuff. And so actually having having the data is you know part of the most powerful communication that we as real estate professionals can do to buyers and sellers. And so, what Altos does is packages it up so that you can communicate to home buyers and sellers right now about what's happening. Yeah. And I think, you know, even hearing that, I think as an agent or a broker, it's easy to go like, yeah, whatever. It's like another data report or something like that. And I know when I was, you know, full time agent or broker, both these data reports that you guys produce are so powerful to show somebody in the moment, like, are we up? Are we down? What's the trend in, in a in a very, you know, micro accurate way at the, at the zip code level? And it sort of takes away all of the emotional responses of, of, of a buyer or seller to like, well, you might think it feels this way, but this is what the data says, right? Yeah. Or in your price range, like you happen to be in the hottest part of the market, right? You think it's, you think it's very slow, but you're buying where everybody else is buying. And so being able to point to that before you go out, you know, we're in a world where now as a buyer's agent, all of a sudden everything's changed. And so being able to sit down with the, you know, with your market report at the first meeting and saying, this is what the market looks like. And, and, oh, by the way, while we're shopping for your house, I'm going to put this in your inbox every Monday and because, you know, if the market starts changing, we want to know to act fast. Those kind of things are really about like, now more than ever demonstrating, you know, our value and helping people understand how to do the, the make the best decisions. Yeah, absolutely. Well, so I already mentioned this zip code level stuff, but also, I mean, you guys track the national data. I know that, you know, a lot of, maybe not, I don't know if it's fair to say a lot of Wall Street, but like a big hunk of the big money in Wall Street is looking at your data. Is that fair to say? Yeah, sure. We so yeah, we track every zip code in the country, but also, you know, roll it up at, you know, regional and state and national levels. And I publish every Monday a video where I talk about the national data. Like, here's what's happening, here's the latest things on inventory and price changes and, you know, pending sales rates and all those things. And and it can be really hard to do it that quickly. Most data is coming out, you know, last month or two months ago is the most recent stuff. And so we try to get it out every Monday to show what the latest trend is, you know, in what's happening. Like, you know, 
For instance, this week, uh, we are now at the end of August, but like all year long, Florida and Texas have had like inventory really growing, like unsold homes building up. And this week, both of those states ticked down in homes for sale. So like, yeah, so like we're past, looks like we're past the peak of inventory growth in those, in the two biggest states in the country for homes for sale. And so like, that's a message. It's turning the corner and you've got a lot of buyers and sellers out there who think, oh no, they're just, it's, it's still going through the roof. Right. And so those things change very quickly. And that's why we want to be on top of the data. So now, I'm sorry, I want to clarify. Are you saying that inventory went down or prices went down? Inventory. So the story has been this year that, you know, Texas has more homes on the market now. Actually, both Texas and Florida have, and there are back eight states that have more homes on the market now than in 2019 before the pandemic. Wow. So there are up to eight states that have more. So all year long, though, the story is mortgage rates are higher. So demand is lower. So inventory has been building all year long. So every state in the country has more homes for sale now than a year ago. Texas and Florida and Arizona, for example, Arizona has 70% more homes on the market now than a year ago, but still has fewer homes in 2019. So like there is a lot of things going on, but right now the country is normalizing after two years of higher mortgage rates. And so there are more there are roughly normal amounts of homes for sale in eight states. And then, but there's still a bunch of states who have very restricted homes for sale, like the Northeast, you know, and or the Midwest. So Illinois and Connecticut have still have 75% fewer homes on the market now than in 2019. But it's starting to normalize and get back after two years of higher rates. Well, and you know, so you got you got the Fed, you know hinting or almost saying there's going to be, you know, three, three drops in the next six months or something like that. Right. So if you start packaging that together with these, you know, these changes that you're seeing just now, so all of a sudden your, your weekly reports are going to become to be very, yes, to be very powerful. So yeah, everybody expects the fed to cut, you know, the, the short-term interest rates and as a result, the long-term rates respond accordingly, and they've been inching down, right? So mortgage rates are at the lowest point of the year, finally. We haven't really seen demand pick up notably. Like Maybe it took too long this year and people are going to wait till next year, but what we have seen is around the edges, like when you think about inventory growing and you think about affordability and things like that. Like a year ago in September, mortgage rates spiked to 8%. And when they did, buyers, any buyer took a step back they, and therefore inventory built all the way to late November last year. And so the fact that, you know, some of these big states have probably peaked now is because rates have come down. So inventory isn't building more in this moment. Um, and now in September, if we get to September and suddenly the Fed doesn't cut rates, mortgage rates could go the other way, right? Mortgage rates could could respond and, and say, we expected it. We expected rate cuts. And so mortgage rates could jump in September. And then what happens, right? So then you want to track, you know, what's happening there. If you've got sellers, what do they need to know about? Like, are they priced right? Are they going to have to do a price reduction? you know, to stay ahead of the market. All of those things are, that's what's in the data that we can track every week. Yeah. This is a little little left field question, but I'm curious what you think about, you know, do you factor all of this crazy inflation stuff into what you're looking at? You know, in, in all the years that I've known you and spoken to you, we, we didn't have this kind of, you know, powerful inflation as a factor. Is that something that you weigh into your analysis? We, we're tracking the houses. And so we're tracking, you know, here's every house for sale. Here's where they're priced. Uh, you walk into the market in Atlanta today. Here's what homes cost, right? Here's the median price. Uh, here's how long it take to sell. So we don't adjust that data for inflation, for example. But what you can see is that in the headline inflation numbers that everybody talks about, like home prices went up 
and the things like rent went up and those get factored into the inflation number and they went up dramatically. And that was one of the drivers of inflation. The cost of the roof over our head went up as we were buying everything in sight. But we can also see that home prices are basically flat for two years now. They went up a little bit, you know, depending on how you measure them, they went up a little bit. We can see that rents are flat year over year. So the headline inflation numbers take a long time to absorb the real-time real estate numbers. And so what it tells us is that, you know, the headline inflation numbers were, are going to keep coming down because the real estate components of those are flat. They're not really driving anything higher. So that's how you can, you can use it. You can be, you know, ahead of the, the, the knowledge on inflation, you know, the CPI, the, the, you know, the consumer price index, those things, because those things take into account the costs of, of renting and, and purchasing homes. And it takes a while for that number to absorb. And in the real-time data, like I can tell you exactly what's happening, you know, to, to home prices and to, and to rents right now. Yeah. Well, tell us, tell us. Man, tell us. <laughs> so, so, you know, home prices, so like, it depends on how you measure them. One of the ways we measure is like, if I walk into the market today, what's the median price of homes that are for sale? What can I buy? That's slightly different from a traditional approach, which is how much did this house, how much did people spend? How much did this house cost two months ago? Or the things like the Case Shiller Index, which is if we look at the same house sold now and last time it sold in 2012. What's the difference in that, in the price of that house? Like those are all different measures. And if you look at the, like the Case Shiller Index came out this week. It still says home prices are up 5% year over year. The real-time data in the active, so homes where the asking prices are, the ones that are going into contract, they're basically up 0 to 3% for the year. So we're going to finish the headlines in 2024, seeing in this like 0 to 3% home price gains is what, is what all the headlines are going to so zero in on. Basically, unchanged home prices. And really, the peak of home prices was June of 22, and flat, slightly down a little bit last year, finish up. So we're bouncing around. And the way I look at it is like we have, there's more homes for sale now. We still have an affordability challenge. Obviously, home prices, homes are expensive, and mortgage rates are still higher. And so there's nothing in the data that indicates home prices are going to appreciate quickly yet. Right. And in fact, like you could imagine a scenario where we have, but, but there's also nothing in the data that shows home prices falling. There are a lot of buyers, potential buyers, I think, who are waiting on the sidelines right now who are like, well, I'm just going to wait till home prices crash and then I'm going to swoop in for my, for my deal. Right. Right. And home prices, they, they could crash. Like who knows what could happen that way out in the future. But there's nothing in the data now that shows home prices crashing. There's no, there's a couple of markets that showing year over year home price declines like Austin, Texas, you know, but, but there's, there's nothing in the data that shows home prices crashing. And there's nothing in the data for me that looks like we're going to get super out of balance with supply and demand, which would create conditions where home prices could crash. So for example, if we're in a world where inventory is climbing and inventory keeps climbing, rates, let's say mortgage rates jump back to 8%, inventory would then keep climbing and demand goes down. Now you start to get in a, a space where you get out of balance with supply and demand. But um, you still, I mean, you really still can't anticipate quote unquote crash without in the in the absence or i should say in the presence of so much equity right there's mm -hmm. you know you're not going to have foreclosure in, in mass right given where we are today which you know obviously happened in 2008 or whenever but you know that's the thing that that blows me away when people talk about a crash i'm like it might drop significantly you could drop 5% 10% but yeah. you know i don't i don't anyway what do you yeah, think yeah. I mean, if home prices drop ten percent, I'm still not selling my house that's got a two percent mortgage on it, right? Exactly. And and so, I think that's very true. And you know, there are you know, we're still at record few foreclosures. 
right? Delinquencies ticked down last quarter, right? And it's because, you know, in in a world, you know, in previous like big recessions, let's say job loss, big job loss recession hits. In 2008, the worst thing on my books was my more my upside down mortgage that was resetting at higher rates. The first yeah. thing I want to do is walk away from that mortgage. Mm -hmm. Now, it's the best asset in the history of mankind. The last thing I want to do is get rid of my 3% mortgage. And so no, even if I lose my job, like, and I want to, and like for a long time, and I'm worried about it, I'm going to scramble as hard as I can to hold on to that house because, you know, I could sell the house to take the equity. And some people will do that, right? You'll see some more inventory, but even if I do that, my rent payment is going to be higher than my mortgage payment. So it's still a better deal to do everything I can to hold on to that house. And so there's nothing in the data that shows, you know, big stretch, a big group of like distressed inventory or a big surge of inventory. The number of sellers each week still remains very low, little more than last year. Last year was the lowest, lowest, fewest sellers, a little more than last year. You know, each year we'll have, we'll get a little more normalized, a few more sellers to get back to normal pace, but there's no flood of sellers. And I watch this every week because what if things change? What if there is more sellers? What, you know, and, and we want to know that we want to be ahead of that curve, uh, but there's still nothing in the data that shows that there, there's any kind of flood of sellers. That's cool, Mike. Well, so, you know, when I talk to agents and brokers, I know that they say, they listen, they listen to a conversation like this and they go, man, how do I talk like that? Like, how do I get in a room and sound smart and tell my consumers more about the data and what's really happening? And, you know, obviously that's what you guys do. You have tons of tools for that. Can you go a little deeper into how agents should be and could be using your data to sound smart and, you know, and also, you know, educate their people? Yeah. I mean, I'll give you a couple of great examples and then some general ones. We do have, we have a, we actually wrote an ebook that is a free ebook and, they, and people can go to altosresearch.com and go download free ebook. And it is how to use market data to build your real estate business, right? It is how to talk about the data and it's like scripts and it's, you know, scenarios. And it's like, here's what the data, you know, here, here's, here's how to read the chart. So they can go get that free ebook and use it in their business. And I haven't read this ebook, but I'm betting that it answers Mike's three big questions that can, that the, what are the top three questions? Tell, the, tell us Mike. The three what questions. The I've been saying this on stage for almost 20 years now. Uh, yeah. What's for sale? How much is the house worth? And how's the market? So there are only three questions, right? So you're sitting there with somebody who goes like, oh, hey, Matt, oh, you're in real estate. How's the market? You know, you think about your lead gen and you have new listing alerts. That's the what's for sale question. But when there's not that many sellers, there's not that many listing alerts. But every week there's, how's the market? Like, is it tanking? I think it's, I heard it's going to tank. I hear the market's, you know, really rough. What's happening? And so we use market data to answer that how's the market question. And then you do things like, you know, you're sitting down in the listing presentation and they're worried, right? I hear there's no buyers. And, or should we do this now? Should we wait till spring? And what we can do is, you know, you sit there and you put your market report on the top of the, the stack of the listing presentation. You go like, when we have your house listed, you know, are you a big geek or a little geek? Because if you're if you're a big geek, I'm going to put this this report in your inbox every Monday, and you're going to you're going to like look at it. You're going to you're going to see you're going to be able to track all the numbers. You're going to see your price range. But even if you're just a little geek, I want you to look at one number. I want you to watch this one number each week when you have your house listed, and maybe it's our market action index, which is like buyer versus seller market. And if the buyers are building, that little thermo this speedometer is. Is going down. And if we have your house listed and this market action index is ticking down, like that is showing your competition increasing and your buyers decreasing. And so we may want to get ahead of that. And so now, you know, four weeks in, we don't have any offers. You get the, the seller who says, Matt, I've been watching this report. Maybe we should do a price reduction so that we get ahead of it. And you don't have to have that conversation with them. You don't have to initiate that because they are in control 
they know what the market is telling them. And it's not Matt making a decision. It's like the market is telling us this. So there are all those kind of powerful things to do with the data in their inbox. Market data is fresh every week, right? There's always a story there. And so you can use that in your conversation. You can, even if it's just like, hey, you know, you might not know, there's only 18 homes for sale in, in this part of town. You know, in 2019, there were 40, right? I know you think there's more than a couple of years ago, but there's not that many homes for sale. Like there's all these messages that are in the market data every week, immediately when you're sitting down with clients. And when you put it in their inbox, so they go dig it for themselves. That's cool. So so we can get the ebook. How else can people connect with you and stay connected to the to the best information? Well, I do a YouTube video every Monday with the national data. And so they can go to the Altos Research YouTube channel and follow that. And we will, and we do a monthly webinar where we spend an hour talking about all the data. We do some of the local markets that we dive in. All of those are, you know, they can they can just follow along. They can they can go to Altos and get a free market report for their local time, or or you'd like just you know book a free consult with our team. I'm like, oh, how do I talk about the market? You know, I live in Boston, and and right now, Bo the Boston market's been actually hot this year, so. You know, how do you talk about that local market it might be very different for you and dive into the data. And, and that ebook is really useful. Dude, well, super cool. It was great to catch up with you, Mike. And uh, your, uh, your insights are always amazing. So uh, thank you so much for joining the Triangle Real Estate Podcast. <laughs>